really, I don't even think you need an introduction, but I'm going to do it because I met you many, many, many years ago at SANS when you were the lead for uh, 504 and I was starting to teach 504 and yep. you were incredibly helpful, you know, mentor since then on many things I've done uh, from writing a course and, and even giving hints on how to do public speaking, which you know, you're not just born with you, you practice. So really appreciate uh, everything you've done and giving back to the community, of course, and, you know, the hundreds and thousands of people you've taught through 504, but also the work you've done with Black Hills uh, Information Security with active countermeasures and really putting an awesome team together there that uh, have done some collaboration with us and, and just awesome stuff, John. So really appreciate it, uh, that you're here. Um, and we'll just turn it over to you. I mean, you're just awesome. Thank you for being good. Well, thank you so much and appreciate everything that you're doing, kicking ass. You know, one of the reasons why I finally felt comfortable to leave SANS and 504 is I had some good hands uh, between you and Derek Rook and McDouglas. And of course, Josh, it was just really, really nice to have some people that could kind of take that torch and just run with it as well. But today I wanted to talk a little bit about a topic that um, I spend, I've been giving variations of this presentation for about three and a half years. And the basic premise is burn it all and start over. And the reason why is it seems in information security, we get into these bad processes where we have baggage and we continue to just do the same things that we've done for years for no good reason other than the fact that we've done that for years, so we should continue doing that moving forward. And whenever you're looking at what's happening right now in the industry, there's a tremendous amount of change that needs to come about. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of those things. So whenever you look at this, it definitely seems like we're in a bad loop, a chiasm, like just repeating again and again and again. And many people in the industry that do offensive security or purple teaming, we get very frustrated because we get the exact same questions again and again and again. What's the best antivirus? What's the best data loss prevention? What's the best threat intel feed? And you can talk about architecture, you can talk about security policies and practices, and then someone will sit down and go, but which firewall should I use? It's like, you just don't understand it. it people are constantly missing the point because we're constantly in this really poor pattern and we need to start finding ways to break out of that pattern as well. So one of my all time favorites kind of set this whole entire thing off of just how bad the industry actually is at kind of regurgitating the exact same garbage again and again and again is passwords. This is simple, right? Um, the, the primacy of passwords is huge. We use it everywhere and almost universally you'll find somebody at a conference somewhere they'll be like, well, we just shouldn't use passwords anymore. It's like, right. I can safely ignore you now. Um, it, it, you know, there's these, there's these like high flutin ideas and we should switch to just biometrics or, you know, what is the patterns of clickety clacks on a keyboard that represents who you are, or some kind of an amalgamation of where you're logging in from, what device you're logging in from and all this crap. And that's just great from a theoretical perspective, but the reality is passwords are going to continue. We're gonna be using them for quite some time. So if it was that important, you would think that we'd be putting a lot of effort in trying to secure them. And ultimately you come back to many organizations, even though this is getting better, but many organizations look at password complexity in the same way that they've looked at it for a long time. It must be eight or more or greater than eight characters, alphanumeric, upper, lower case, special characters, no dictionary words, and there's a tremendous amount of fail in trying to set up your passwords this way. And one of the big arguments that we get as a counter argument is, well, we can't fix this because of compliance. Quick example, we had a customer that we tested, and I hope you're listening today because I remember you. We had a customer that we tested, a very, very large household name customer, and this particular customer had seven character passwords throughout their entire organization. Once we gained access to the inside of that network, lateral movement was trivial. Taking over multiple accounts was incredibly easy, and complete account and domain took over, takeover was less than half a day. Now, most organizations, when this happens, the vast majority of them, like 99.99% of them is they basically take it like we've done wrong and we want to do better. And I'm like, great, let's, let's fix your passwords. It didn't work that way. With this customer, they said, ah, got you. This can't be a critical finding. I'm like, what do you mean this can't be a critical finding? This can't be a critical finding because PCI says that the minimum password length 
is seven characters. Checkmate, John. Like, what in the hell are we thinking? If we're actually going to listen to somebody like PCI, and they're going to say the minimum is seven characters, or we're going to say, well, we're going to set it to seven characters. Regardless of the security implications, we're going to do that because some compliance document told us to do so. That's garbage, and we can do better. And yes, I hope some people from PCI are listening. I hope they're on this webcast because you need to fix this, like now. So we're constantly fighting all of these different problems in computer security, and a lot of them are very much legacy problems. And if we're looking at the eight character password, I don't, you know, PCI does something else for legacy computer systems because it's absolute complete garbage. But a lot of the eight character passwords can go back to the NIST green book. In 1985, they said L is set for six months and 12 months, P is set for one in one million, the acceptable probability for guessing a password, and R is set at 8.5 guesses per minute, the guess rate possible with a 300 baud modem. And they basically said that you should change your passwords because the Russians could crack all of those passwords every six months maximum, so people cut it in half. So many organizations are still beholden to the exact same password complexity requirements that existed in 1985. Why? Because it was created in this green book and then another compliance standard came and they stole it from this green book. And then another compliance standard and they stole it from that compliance standard. And we continue to see this stuff carry forward and this garbage keeps moving forward and we don't change things because it's the way we've always done them and it's the way that compliance tells us to do them. Another example. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm getting a little bit frustrated with this argument in the industry. And there's some people that I love deeply in this industry that are on the other side of the argument from where I am. And I'm not afraid to meet them. You look at Florian, you, the guy that's running Sigma. You look at Richard Bachelik. I love these people. people. Richard Bachelik was my hero and still is to this day. But they have this belief that the offensive security community should not release offensive tools. We shouldn't be bypassing things like antivirus, data loss prevention, firewalls, finding new techniques, creating backdoors, because they think that we are helping the adversary. And in some respect, they are correct. They are absolutely correct. But I believe it's incredibly important for us as offensive professionals, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, that we need to be breaking these things. We need to be bypassing these things constantly. We need to be releasing tools constantly to the community that are showing weaknesses so these weaknesses can get fixed. You see, when you're looking at something that's broken, things are only fragile until they break and then we make them stronger. And in the offensive community, one of the big things that we have to do is we have to constantly be breaking things to make things stronger. That is what we are doing. And I'll show you here in a little bit later why that's so incredibly important. It's not a new idea. This has been something that has absolutely been happening in the state of architecture and engineering for years. So every year at BHIS, we do this webcast series called Sacred Cash Cow Tipping, where we go through and bypass all the different antivirus engines, and we do it like the day before we give the webcast. Why? Because we want to show people that they cannot build their entire architecture on endpoint security alone. On one side, we have marketing campaigns. Whenever you walk through airports, you have silence, stop, silence is all attackers. You had CrowdStrike, zero false positive. You have all of these different vendors saying that their stuff is going to stop all of these different attacks. But the people that do this for a living know that these products actually have weaknesses that can and will be bypassed. And that's not to say that they're garbage. It's to say that there's weaknesses. And understanding those weaknesses is key for us to actually build better security architectures. So whenever we're talking about a lot of these things, we need to leave a lot of the existing things that we keep investing so much time, effort, and money, and we gotta, need to leave them behind. Like traditional antivirus blacklisting, we don't see hardly any customers that are just running straight blacklist AV, but there's a lot of organizations out there. Unfortunately, the people that listen to this webcast, the people that go to SANS, and the people that go to our webcast, they are people that are on the pointy end of the spear. They're the customers for companies like Grimm. They're the customers for companies like TrustedSec and in Guardians and Black Hills Information Security. But that's a very small percentage of the entire organizational units that exist on the planet. And most organizations are still just using traditional antivirus. 
data loss prevention, relying so much on firewalls. I can't even begin to tell you, like how often I hear people focus on, well, we need a firewall review. We need you to go through and analyze our firewalls. And on the other side of that coin, whenever you're talking to the offensive community, I almost never hear someone who does offensive security say, well, God, their firewall shut me down, unless it's host-based firewalls. And we'll talk about that more later. Threat intelligence feeds. I'm going to say this right now, again, for the 150th time. Most threat intelligence feeds and the way that we ingest them are garbage. You're buying old data. You're buying data that is from last week, a month ago, two months ago, and you're getting a very small slice of the entire attack methodologies that are out there and the adversaries that we're dealing with. But you're so hardwired to think in terms of block listing or excuse me, deny listing. We need to stop the bad people, because the bad people are using these techniques. If we don't have those techniques or we block them, then the bad people will go away. No, they won't. We need to start getting beyond this idea that we can somehow enumerate all of the evil in the world and block all of the evil in the world, and then we'll be secure. We need to leave these things behind. And if we start it all over, how would we do it? And this is not an exhaustive presentation. Really, I'm hoping that it'll kick you off and start you thinking in terms of how you can start doing things differently. Whenever you do something in security, asking yourself, why exactly are we doing it this way? Does this actually provide value? Does this actually stop any attacks out there as well? So once again, threat intelligence feeds. Number of people that I've been talking to, we've known this for years, but companies will spend millions of dollars on threat intel feeds. And one of the things you find out whenever you dig underneath the surface is that most threat intel feeds do not work. Once again, offensive companies that do this for a living, once again, I don't know of any of them. Trusted Second, Guardians, BHIS, Rendition, Grim, where we sit around and like, boy, God, that threat intelligence feed, that got us. Never once has that come up in conversation. And I'm willing to bet that if you went to Russia, if you went to China, if you went to the NSA, they would say something very, very similar at their higher end attackers and what they're doing. And in this research, this dark reading article, they found that the amount of overlap between threat and tell feeds was something like one to the high 1% to at the high end 13% overlap. That tells me that these things are woefully incomplete and you're paying for them. However, some people take this to mean, well, to become completely complete, we've got to buy more. This is stupid. Let's not do this. There's better freaking ways than buying IP blacklists and hashes. We need to do better and we can. We can actually do better. Another one, internet allow listing. Let's, let's talk about something that we can do that it can actually change. There's absolutely bypass techniques that exist. We can get into some of those um, buying domains that have recently came for sale that are on different allow lists. But whenever you're looking at internet deny listing, where we're gonna try to deny all of the evil websites, this will never, ever, 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 ever work. It has not worked ever in this industry. It will not work moving forward into the future. It is trivial for an attacker to stand up a brand new domain, attack another organization right on top of that domain, and use domain fronting. There's a number of ways that we can do this, but the point is just trying to enumerate evil is not going to work. Some of the fun things that you can do, restrict uncategorized. If you're looking at a lot of these different vendors like Forcepoint, if you're looking at Cisco Umbrella, if or you're looking at all of these different vendors, OpenDNS, which of course is with Cisco and things like that. If you're looking at these vendors and if they're looking at a domain and a website and they're like, yeah, we've never seen that before. You don't want your users going there. That will actually shut down a tremendous number of attacks. Just please do me a favor, put the pitchforks away for a couple of seconds. You can do this, it's not that hard. One of my favorite ones out for blacklisting and denial listing is uh, Pi-hole. If you set it up and it goes to a website it's never seen before, it's like, hey, are you sure you wanna go? Pause, reflect, think about what you're doing. What's the phrase? Laid out on the floor until the urge passes. But if you decide that you have to go, you can click here to continue to this website. 
So this goes back to Marcus Random's rant that he went on years ago, right? This is a long time ago. And he was talking about how denialisting was never going to work, or what he called it enumerating badness back then. And he said the amount of legitimate apps and traffic, the hostile apps and traffic, he said the amount of hostile apps and traffic that are out there are growing far faster than the amount of legitimate software traffic and websites and IP addresses that we're going to. 13 years ago, Marcus was talking about this. 13. And everybody listened to Marcus and they're like, hmm, no, no, clearly this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And we moved on. Um, one of my favorite quotes, he said, whenever he created his version of the er one of the earliest firewalls ever, it was beautiful and wonderful. And it was this amazing thing that was starting out. And then immediately people took a shotgun to it and blew port 80 straight through and let everything through, completely undermining the entire capabilities of what we can get with that. He was right then. And he's right today as well. Some other fun games that you can play. Um, how many legitimate websites do your users go to? 200, 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. Really try to find out. Go through and say, what are the standard websites that users go to? The vast majority of users will go to the exact same websites every single day. They're just gonna get into a habit and do it again and again and again and again and again. And many of those websites are gonna be the same websites that other users are going to. So let's say that we allow all of them. Let's say that you had a magic button on your egress web proxy that your user goes to a website that's uncategorized like, are you sure? Yes, no, they click yes. And you let the inmates run the asylum. They could literally click a button and go to any website that they wanted to. Would your overall exposure to the evil on the web, on the, on the web be more or less than it is today? It would be less and not just like a small percentage less, it would be far, far smaller than trying to do traditional denial listing on websites. Also with ads, do me a solid, let them die. Just start blocking them. And I know you got users that go to websites and are like, oh, it seems that you're using an ad blocker. You can't go to this website. You probably don't want your users going to those websites anyway. The other thing about personal web browsing, for the love of God, for standard corporate computers, people don't need to browse the web. Uh, to just general things like Facebook. They have their phones and all they need to do is just use their phone for a lot of those things and lock everything down. There's ways that we can do this, but it requires us to start thinking differently. And different sucks. If you actually start implementing some of this, just by the fact that it's different, users are going to complain, but we're not gonna get better unless we start pushing through some of these changes. So filtering. You know, go through and add all the different categories that you think are needed for your organization to run. But if you have uncategorized, don't let your users go to the uncategorized category. Yeah, sure, uncategorized category. Block them, just don't allow it to happen. And also please understand, I'm pretty sure that somebody in Discord is typing up, well, I can bypass that by doing this. Yes, you are no fun at parties. I'm gonna get to you here in just a second. You sit tight. But what it's going to do is it's going to reduce your overall exposure. Because one of the things we're gonna discuss here is that there's no security control that's 100%. And anybody that talks about weaknesses of security controls and how they can bypass them and all these different things, once again, is somebody that you should not hang out with. You shouldn't date those people. You shouldn't go drink with those people. You shouldn't be at a party with those people. Ignore them and put them in the bad security professional box for a while. And we'll get more to that here in just a moment. So application allow listing. Okay, this one's not as easy. Uh, this one is actually kind of difficult. But getting back to that person that's kind of a jerk, that they're like, well, you know, I can bypass internet allow listing by going through and specifying or buying a domain. I could use a tool like Domain Gain from Full Metal Cash, and then I can find all the domains. I can see how much they are. I can buy it, and it's going to be on the whitelist, and I'm going to bypass it. What are you going to do now? See, the problem with offensive security people, and, and I need to get in close for this, I need you to understand offensive security people. Is traditionally, we have been a-holes in the community and we need to stop. Why do I say that? Because for years, if you went to someplace like Black Hat or DEF CON or Derby CON, there's always somebody that does offensive security and they can break anything. And I admit, I was on that train, folks. I'm a reformed person and I'm trying to save you too. We would walk around and part of our self-worth came from how good we were at hacking things. People would talk about different security technologies and we'd be like, oh, well, I can bypass that by doing this and this and this. Look at me, I'm awesome. That's a jackass move. 
No one likes that person. You're not cool. Don't. Really, one of the reasons why you see the trajectory of a lot of offensive security professionals over the years to start arcing back towards blue is because whenever you realize everything is broken, you have two choices. You either ride that all the way down or you try to make things better. And a bunch of people that I know, people like Chris Gates, people like Mubix, they really try to focus on how they can make things better. And that's what we need to start doing. We can't have it because this view of if something can be bypassed or attacked in one small way, it's garbage, is absolutely horrible for this industry. In short, we need to stop being wizards trying to impress other wizards. There's this new debate, I guess, in the industry, I haven't came across it yet, where they're like, well, how many CVEs have you written? Uh, who cares? Why is that becoming the sole gate and the sole value for someone in this industry? It's garbage, folks, and we can do better. And this is a con that has a lot of offensive people. And if you're getting your self-worth from putting other people down, I'm telling you right now, you're not welcome in this community. Please go away. I'm sure that there's some place in Fortran for you. That's fine. Go there. Because we really want to do better in the industry. And you can do better. Use your powers for good and not evil. So yeah, setting up default rules, these default rules, it's funny, I talk to people all the time, they're like, well, these default rules are garbage. If I go into Microsoft Windows 10 and I set up App Locker and it locks down to everything to the program files, the Windows directory and only admins can run thing, well, I can do evil grade style attacks, I can write an exploit for anything that's in the program files directory. They can come up with all of these ways to attack it. And the problem is other people listen to that and then they start thinking, well, we just shouldn't do that because clearly I talked to this, this ass that was talking about all these ways to bypass them, but the conversation doesn't come back to, this will greatly reduce the overall exposure of attacks against your organization. If you take antivirus away from somebody and you say, what are you going to do to stop attackers? One of the first thing any good security professionals are gonna do is drop right in and start setting up application whitelisting or allow listing on their computer system. They're going to. And it's gonna be really effective at the vast majority of drive-by downloads that are out there. So once again, let's get past the whole, well, you know, I can do all these different techniques to bypass this, but really getting back to, this will stop things from executing in temporary files, temporary internet files from the desktop, from being downloaded and then executed. It'll actually reduce those attacks. This works, folks. We can do this. We can make these recommendations. These are the easiest rules that you can implement on a computer system. And yeah, you might have to go through and do some tweaking, but it's going to start a large, stop a large number of the different attacks that are out there. And ultimately, one of the things I constantly come back to is everything we do as IT engineers is about architecture. It is. So whenever you look at architecture and you design, if you're looking at like load factor re resistance design and structural engineering, everything in engineering, and this drives my wife crazy because she's a structural engineer and she hates it when I say it, but everything in engineering is about failure. Everything is about failure. And when they design their architectures and they design trusses and they tr design load bearing members, and you start talking about sheer moment diagrams, at what point do things fail and how exactly do they fail? Everything is about that failure. And every building that you walk into, every truss that you see, everything has a failure point. They design it so you have all these trusses that are all set up and they're amazing and they know how they fail. And because they know how they fail, they can design an architecture in such a way that a failure in one specific point doesn't necessarily lead to a catastrophic failure of the entire architecture. It comes back to failure points, mitigations, understanding weakness, building mitigations, setting up planning with mitigations, component failure thresholds with mitigations. And that's the way you need to look at security architecture. Not I can hack it, but you know that if it is hacked, there's another control someplace, other, someplace else in a, in a mitigation that's going to stop a catastrophic attack from taking over an entire organization. So I do believe 
offensive security is incredibly important. I do believe that trying to shut down the offensive community and throw us in a closet and not have us release what we're doing publicly is a grave disservice because it's weakening our architectures. But we have to do it with respect. And we always have to do it with what would be the recommendation to stop this tool, to stop this attack, and how we can make things better. Because that's how we get better in this industry. And let's start doing that more. So roadmaps, another one, people hate certification, accreditation, compliance, one of the least favorite things. I'm gonna go very, very quickly over this. Check out audit scripts, critical security control tools. Uh, if you're spending a lot of money trying to do mapping to ISO standards, to NIST standards, to the NSA standards, to all these different standards around the world, this will make your life so much easier. It's free and it just is amazing. They have tracking spreadsheets on your overall compliance and all these different types of areas. They have the cross mapping of all the different audit standards back to the critical security controls that makes it like a Rosetta Stone. You need to do this because otherwise you're chasing your tail by constantly trying to be in compliance with a bunch of ridiculous audit and compliance standard frameworks that have like 90% overlap with each other. So check it out. All right, so the MITRE slide. Okay, like I say in here, it's required by law. Do not remove. Um, I think MITRE is a blessing and I think it's a curse. I think MITRE without question is a blessing because I ripped on threat intelligence feeds earlier because they're garbage. But what's happening with what's going on in organizations is they're actually looking and finding patterns in the different TTPs that attackers are using and that is gold. Now, Bryson will talk a little bit later about like, you know, the MITRE bingo card that we see all the time where you have vendors that are constantly saying, well, we detect this and this and this and this and this and this, or we have 80% overlap, 90%, whatever. But from an architectural perspective, this matters because if you look across the top, they go through all the different ways from initial access to execution, to persistence, all the way over to command and control and data exfiltration and the damage that can be done. And it allows you to start looking at your organization from an architectural perspective to stop a lot of these attacks. Unfortunately, most vendors are trying to play the bingo card where they're trying to detect every individual technique and they're mapping it over to like, you know, uh, atomic red team and, or, or maybe Caldera. And they're like, oh, we detected that. But they don't understand that those are representative samples of those types of attacks. So that gets into a problem where we're trying to write individual signatures to stop these individual like examples that are referenced within MITRE. And that's the wrong way to do it. That's going back to that deny listing of trying to enumerate badness. But if you can look at this as a framework and you can look at it as an, maybe an execution framework for adversarial simulation, if you can look at it as a framework for how we can design our architecture in stuff, such a way to stop a lot of these attacks with just a few controls, all of a sudden you're thinking about it in the right way. This is actually threat intelligence. This is actually threat intelligence that's valuable. Where you're talking about, well, you know, we see the attacks constantly using PowerShell. Maybe we should do something about PowerShell. Instead of trying to write a signature for a specific tool, maybe we should try to figure out how we can handle PowerShell across our entire organization in such a way that we'll be able to detect those types of attacks. And that's just one example. So we're changing the way that we can look at what we're doing. And that's beautiful with MITRE, but it's also a trap because now we're trying to use it to create more in-depth deny lists. And that does not work. So let's, let's talk about one example, all right? So if you go back to MITRE, there's the lateral movement, right? And this actually can go uh, and stop uh, credential access, discovery, and lateral movement within an environment, all right? So let's talk about one simple thing that organizations can do that'll deny the attacker a tremendous swath of data that's in the MITRE attack technique matrix. Firewalls on your hosts, turn them on. Really, just turn them on, that's it. I mean, that's the trick. Make it so your workstations cannot talk to each other. Servers can talk to workstations, workstations can talk to server subnets, and workstations can't talk to each other at all. That's it, there's no real good reason ever for your workstations to talk to each other. And I know there's people that are like, well, what about Skype? And there's ways you can configure Skype in your environment that this is not necessary. And I know people will be like, well, this is the way we set it up. No, go read the Microsoft docs. You can actually change it. At any rate, it's a long conversation, but you can stop host to host communication in your environment. And why would you wanna do that? 
Well, it's kind of revisiting something. Just your standard everyday exploit, server-side exploit, something like 93% of the attacks that organizations get hit with are pretty much this. User goes to a website, user opens up an email, clicks on something, downloads something, bang, they're infected, right? All right, so now we've got this one system that's compromised on the inside of the environment. Then the attacker is gonna use the built-in protocols in your environments to try and move laterally. They're gonna use things like PS exec, pass the token, our desktop, pass the hash. They're gonna use a number of different tools to leverage these protocols to gain access to these other computer systems. And there are products out there, right, that are detecting lateral movement, but the number of organizations that have those implemented and are willing to spend like, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars for those products is kind of small. So you have an attacker that starts moving laterally across the entire environment. And this also goes back to some vendors. Like I said, just another rant. You have vendors out there who I'm not going to name in this particular webcast, but they say, oh, well, we can detect this type of lateral movement in the environment and you write us checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can do that or what you could do is you could actually turn on the whole space firewalls because the attacker, whenever they move laterally, are going to move easily throughout the environment. Lateral movement in the vast majority of organizations today is relatively simple. Now, once again, to be sure, there are organizations that are doing phenomenally well at stopping lateral movement, but those are usually organizations that have been tested multiple years by reputable firms. Those organizations are rare. So, this is what most attacks look like. But if you're looking at this whole concept that I've been talking about with the MITRE attack technique matrix, you're talking about how we traditionally look at vulnerabilities, all of this crap falls apart really quick. Why? Because traditional vulnerability assessments, whenever you're looking at it, they don't look at it like architecture. They look at it like we're going to scan a network and we're gonna find ex and exploit public facing applications, remote services, and there's another one here for misconfiguration. And your vulnerability scanners, if you're using Nessus, you're using Rapid7, you're running any of those different products, they're gonna look for these types of vulnerabilities and they're gonna to try to fix them for you or they're gonna give you recommendations on how to fix them. When we're thinking of vulnerabilities, we're still thinking in terms of missing patches. We're still thinking in terms of misconfigurations. But if we go back to that lateral movement, if we go back here, all of these ways that we move around, be PS exec, pass the token, our desktop, privilege escalation techniques, those are vulnerabilities too. But by and large, organizations forget about those vulnerabilities because it doesn't show up on a report from a vulnerability scanner as a critical as something that they need to fix. So they're not even testing. If you're looking at this entire thing, they're not even testing for over 90% of the different types of techniques that can exist in the MITRE attack technique matrix out there. So that's why I think threat emulation is really important because we need to couple that with what we're doing in vulnerability management space because those are vulnerabilities that are being ignored. For the life of me, I don't understand why vulnerability assessment vendors that are out there right now aren't scooping up threat emulation vendors as quickly as they possibly can to augment their offerings. Why is that not happening? I have no idea. I'm just gonna attribute it to they're dumb. And we're just gonna roll with that. And I've had meetings with many of these companies. And they're like, well, what should we do? We have lots of money. We don't know what to do. I'm like, hey, develop this capability. And they're like, hmm, no. I think what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna focus on vulnerability prioritization in organizations. Why? Because managers talk about that as being a problem that most organizations have kind of solved relatively quickly. So instead of actually fixing like this massive issue of privilege escalation and lateral movement, we're gonna to continue to reshuffle the chairs on the deck of the Titanic and make the reports prettier. No, we need to be doing that threat emulation because those are vulnerabilities. You have the ability now to automate the capability to mimic most of the techniques that an attacker would do post exploitation. That's huge. And that's one of the things that we absolutely need to start doing. So if we go back to firewalls, right? If we're doing threat emulation, we're looking at vulnerability analysis and how we're gonna tie this all together. You know what? You turn on your host-based firewalls and all of a sudden you've denied like, I think 20% of the techniques on the MITRE attack technique matrix. So instead of playing like MITRE whack-a-mole or bingo, you could just shut off entire categories of attacks. Or you can focus and channel the attacker to go to servers where you can have increased monitoring. Basically, the more pathways that are available to an attacker, the more you have to monitor what they're doing. 
if we can reduce the pathways available to the attacker, two things happen. The attacker is going to run into the firewall and they're going to blindly hit things and they're going to make mistakes and that's going to set off alarms. That's good. The other thing that's going to happen is the pathways available to them are going to be reduced. This is also good because it allows us to focus our monitoring technologies on those specific pathways. You can use the firewalls, Windows built-in firewall if you hate yourself. NetSH ADV firewall is not your friend, but it's turn it on if it's all that you got. Most of your endpoint security vendors, they have built-in firewalls, turn those on. I honestly don't care. But if you do that, it's gonna deny the attacker an amazing amount of pathways to move laterally in the environment as well. So now all of a sudden, if we're talking about defense and death, which we clearly got wrong 15, 20 years ago, if an attacker tries to move laterally with any of these different protocols, they're gonna slam up against all of these different firewalls and all of those little mistakes that they make, those are detection opportunities for you. So it means that we have to have the ability to stop that attack and we need to have the ability to alert when it happens. All right, new rant. Talked about passwords briefly at the beginning. The only thing that matters in passwords is length, okay? That's it. I've been to a ton of presentations where they sit there and they talk about choosing a good password. Well, we're not gonna use dictionary words and we're gonna use these special character substitutions or some idiots are like, well, all you have to do is just shift your typing over one key. Oh God. Um, the only thing that matters is length, folks. Set up length of 16 characters, allow dictionary words, but keep the upper lower special characters and numbers because that'll add in some variance and spice uh, to actually make it more difficult. Now. This isn't the only thing that you should be doing, but this is absolutely a thing that you should be doing. Because when you increase the character length, it grows exponential. So for every character that you add on to a password length, it over doubles the total amount of brute force attempt tries that an attacker has to go through. So if you're going from eight to 16, it's not an issue of just doubling the time it takes to attack. We're talking about exponentially increasing the attack for each character. It's the difference between cracking passwords in a matter of minutes with seven character to eight character passwords. And then with 16 character passwords, having to wait till the heat death of the universe to crack them. Those are two different time scales. We want the attacker to be focused on that higher end time scale. Also, two factor authentication. This is, um, it's funny, we actually started talking about this in one of the pod meetings at BHIS uh, last week and there was some argument about it, about, is two-factor authentication, what type of two-factor authentication. So I'm gonna give you some, some, some wisdom from somebody who's old and decrepit and now only does things in PowerPoint. I don't care what type of two-factor authentication you use. I don't. And I know that I just set off and triggered a bunch of offensive security professionals that are like, but, 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 Wait, if I'm using two-factor authentication and I'm, and I'm using push notifications, I can trick the user to click the link. But, 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 if I'm using SMS like notifications, I can steal someone's phone number or they might respond back to it. But, 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 but U2FA can be bypassed by setting up your interception proxy to tell the server that you're logging into that you're an iPad and you don't accept U2FA. Ah! Once again, you're one of those offensive people that's been in the dungeon too long. Once again, we're not talking about perfect folks. We're talking about improving. And I'm going to tell you right now that any type of two-factor authentication is exponentially better than having no two-factor authentication at all. It is. And I know there's people out there, well, oh, SMS is just garbage. We shouldn't use it. Or you know, push notifications are garbage and we shouldn't use it. You're missing the damn point. There's a huge difference between me password spraying an organization and getting access to hundreds of accounts or doing a phishing campaign and getting into two or three. That, that, that matters, folks. That actually matters quite a lot if we're trying to stop actual attacks against environments. And yes, I know there's people out there that are elite that can get around these things. I understand that. I work with these people every day and hire them. But I will tell you, for organizations that do implement two-factor authentication, they are far more difficult to break into. They absolutely are. And out of, I think we've analyzed something like over 200 different assessments. The organizations that had two-factor authentication came out far, far better than the ones that did not. Like seriously, if you don't have two-factor authentication, stop. You, 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 well, finish this con, finish your copy, and immediately try to get two-factor enabled in your organization. And you're going to have people that are going to argue, and they're going to be like, well, we probably shouldn't have two-factor authentication because it's hard for us to actually implement it. And we don't have a compliance standard yet for our industry that's telling us to do it. It's recommended, but it's not required. Look, Teen Vogue 
Teen Vogue recommends to teenagers, predominantly teenage girls, that they should enable two-factor authentication. So if we're talking about com compliance standards, can we at least meet the Teen Vogue standard, please? I mean, if Teen Vogue is saying this is a good idea and you have some other compliance standard that's not there quite yet, yeah, let's go with Teen Vogue on this one. All right, so smarter logging. One of the things I always push in a number of my presentations is the idea of cyber deception. And I wanna give you a very quick and easy cyber deception technique that you can implement. First, you set up an admin account. It doesn't have to actually be an admin account. You can make it an admin account, I guess, if you want to. Just name it something like admin ADM admin. Then you disable all the login hours. You might wanna log into it first, otherwise it's first login time will be January 1st, 1970. Um, and that's the epoch time, we could talk more about that. But you wanna log in with it briefly and then disable its login hours. So no one will ever be able to log into it. Then you wanna set up alerting. So if anybody ever logs into that account, they let you know immediately. Because if an attacker is doing something like internal password spraying post exploitation, it's going to pull down all of the different accounts try to log in with a single password like spring 2020 and then log into every single or try to log into every single account with that password you can get a nice little alert saying hey somebody is trying to do a password spray that's cool this also stops down or shuts down some lateral movement and privilege escalation techniques that we see also please log sysmon i know this is probably a sidetrack but let's start moving on to like edr and good endpoint logging because to be honest Windows logs are just an absolute train wreck as well. Uh, MITRE and egress, I'm running out of time. I've ranted too long and I've gone too far. Um, there's a whole section in MITRE about egress traffic for command and control and exfiltration. Your products don't stop this. They just don't. Um, we have a free product that we've released called RITA, Real Intelligence Threat Analytics. And it looks for patterns in network traffic, specifically looking for beaconing, denialist checking, DNS views, long connections. It's all free. It's all available, you can try it. Um, and if you wanna try it and say, this sucks, great. Open up an issue, let us know, and we can make it better. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into it. It works really, really, really well. It's super cool and it's free. We released it to the public and it does long connection analysis. It does beaconing analysis and you'll find all kinds of weird IOT devices, rogue access in your environment for users using Team Viewer or log me in to log into their home computers to try to bypass your porn folders at work. It'll find that. And it does a really good job at finding that. And it's free. So free as in beer and as speech. So you can go and you can pull it down and it will always be free. We have over 26 patents for what Rita does. And the reason why we got these patents and then we release a free tool is so that we can stop any other stupid vendor from coming up with what we've came up with and trying to stop any project out there from doing the same thing. So we did that specifically so we could keep Rita for free in the community as well. So kind of closing up, how do you go about eating an elephant? Um, well, let's not try to jump into straight full implementation of a lot of these different things. And I see a lot of organizations, let's do full carbon black everywhere. And let's set up, you know, full application allow listing on the environment. It's like, okay, um, let's back up for a couple seconds and we can kind of move things up and start small. Some of these are easy, like the domain admin account, super simple. Go ahead and do that as well. Also with everything that you're doing, whenever we get back to the security professionals that always look at stuff in terms of failure and I can bypass it, I can hack it, I can hack it, I can hack it. Everything can be bypassed. That's why it's important that we have overlapping fields of view. And if we look at the example that I have here with the endpoint, the endpoint is being detected by AV, SIM, network security monitoring, sandboxing, possibly segmentation. You have multiple different overlapping fields because any one of these can be bypassed. But I'm here to tell you it's incredibly difficult if an organization has implemented these things and they have the overlapping fields of visibility, it's incredibly difficult to bypass absolutely all of them as well. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. This is a really super cool con. Um, Bryson and, and Christine and George and the team. Um, and of course, Adam is here as well. I, I find it very weird that Adam and Marcello look so much alike. Um, sometimes I wonder if they're brothers or if maybe it's the same person getting two paychecks. And that's also kind of a setup uh, for Marcello. Uh, sir, are you here with us? 
You're on mute. Yeah, I was. Now I found it. Yes, I am. And thanks for that. Yeah, I think Adam is definitely a long lost brother somehow. I'm not sure where, but <laughs> I'm not All sure right. how that happened. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of offensive tools and making the community incredibly mad, uh, do you have something that you're going to share as far as like offensive tooling, helping people develop offensive tools? Yeah, I'm going to be sharing uh, a presentation on how to actually get it, Python libraries installed the right way so you don't bork up your entire system, which is something right. that a lot of InfoSec professionals, I think, have uh, a lot of trouble with. So hopefully right. that'll be useful. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. Thank you so much, uh, George, Bryson, Christine, Adam, uh, everybody at Scythe, everybody at Grimm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I love all of you guys. It's so cool to have a sister organization um, that's doing so much for the community and kicking ass while they're doing it. And by the way, congratulations on the uh, SDK and everything that you're releasing because it goes back to developing offensive tools, sharing offensive tools, doing it faster to make organizations more secure. Thank you so much. Talk to you all later.